Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today for another episode of STEM Girls Virtual. My name is Emily and I'm here on behalf of Cincinnati Museum Center. On this show, we talk about different careers in the STEM field, those fields being science, technology, engineering, and math. Today we have Dr. Lou Edgy with us. Dr. Edgy and this is an Associate Dean of Graduate Medical Education at the University of Cincinnati Medical Center and is also a UC family physician. Dr. Edgy, thank you for joining us today. You are absolutely welcome. Thank you for the privilege. Thank you. Um, so first things first, I did want to ask you, what is family medicine? What does a family medical doctor do? So a family physician is somebody who um, abides by the three C's. Um, the three C's are comprehensive. So we provide comprehensive care across the entire gamut of specialty uh, areas. Um, the second C is continuous care. So we really take care of patients from cradle to grave across their entire um, spectrum of life. Um, and the third C is coordinated care. So we do make sure that we are connecting our patients to other specialists um, should they need them. And the last C is first contact. And so we are usually the very first uh, specialist that a patient has when they enter into the medical field. Oh, wow. Yes, I still remember my family physician growing up. Um, she's still practicing medicine, which is really neat. And uh, I have friends whose kids now go see her. So it's, it's really neat that you develop this really lifelong connection with your patients. You see them through the highs and lows of their life. So that's, that's a really important job to have, um, being a family medical doctor. And develop, it's, it's good to have a really good relationship with your doctor. Trust is really important. So... Yeah, that's awesome. Absolutely. Yeah. Have you always been interested in STEM? What in particular made you want to become a doctor? So I've always been interested in fixing things and understanding how they work. So the ultimate in that opportunity was um, to become interested in physiology and figuring out how the human body works. And then medicine is a natural segue um, to figuring out how to fix it or to how to keep it healthy. Yeah, that's awesome. And what in particular about family medicine? What did you just specialize in that? Uh, the longevity of relationships with patients. I think um, being able to, to be with a patient all the way through um, from being a child all the way through college and beyond that, meeting their kids, um, delivering babies, all of that. I wanted to be involved with the entire family and develop relationships over time. Sure. Yeah, I was just going to say that you develop uh, really important relationships with entire families and you're almost a witness to their family history through medicine, so. Right, and it helps to be able to um, have a trusting relationship, especially when you're trying to get to the root of problems that they may have, and you're trying to help with not only their physical um, challenges, but also some of the mental health challenges that happen with patients over the course of their lifetime. Sure, sure. Um, so on top of being a family physician, you're also, like I said earlier, the Associate Dean of Graduate Medical Education at the University of Cincinnati Health uh, and Medical Center. Uh, what made you want to work with medical students? So I work with um, learners um, that are medical students, but also residents and fellows. So medical students um, are in medical school. They're learning the basics of medicine, but they haven't been differentiated into their specialty yet. Um, where I work right now is um, specifically with them when they've already chosen a specialty that they wanna learn and develop into. And um, so the residents are of all specialties that I support. There are about 688 of them at the University of Cincinnati Medical Center and about 100 programs. And I have the privilege and the honor of serving um, that, that entire group. That's wonderful. And the University of Cincinnati is a teaching hospital. So there are some hospitals that don't work with um, students like that. Is that true? That's exactly right. And it requires a, a wonderful culture. Um, I think the fun thing, the, the really very cool thing about working in a teaching health center um, situation is that uh, you are required to go ahead and teach them the most up-to-date and evidence-based information. And that by just by virtue forces you to stay up to date on medicine. Um, medicine changes so rapidly and new knowledge is generated so fast uh, that being in this environment is one way to keep up with that. 
Oh, sure. I had my tonsils out as an adult and I did it at UC. So there were students in the operating room and uh, I'm sure as an adult getting their tonsils out that that was probably a really uh, exciting opportunity from a student perspective getting yes. to see that. So but it was, it was really neat getting to see um, the relationship between students and, and the, their maybe mentors and doctors um, in a setting like that. So um, that, was, that was just a really um, memorable experience and on many, uh, re for many reasons, but yes, I got, it, I got it at UC and there were definitely students in the room. It was a great place to get done. <laughs> yes, I, I, again, as an adult, getting your tonsils out, not very uh, pleasant, but the surgery went very well and uh, no complaints. <laughs> But, yeah, yeah. I went off topic a little bit in our interview, but I just thought I'd touch on that. <laughs> it's okay. Um, so I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about um, COVID-19 and in particular vaccines. And um, I know that you are taking part in a study, but before we jump into that, can you tell us what a vaccine is and what they do? Absolutely. So a vaccine is a wonderful opportunity to go ahead and have your body exposed to a virus um, without having to contract the disease. And so what a, a virus um, does have is um, a component of it that is the infectivity part, the, the part that is dangerous to people. And usually the vaccine will go ahead and run a number of different ways. Uh, one is to go ahead and like the mRNA vaccines that are out right now for COVID, they basically have a recipe book for one of the proteins on the outside of the virus. And that recipe book is, um, is in the form of mRNA, which is then coated in this thing called a lipid nanoparticle, which is like a little droplet of fat. And that then gets injected into the muscle and your body learns um, how to dismantle that once it um, gets exposed to the same thing again. Um, and I liken it to a Snapchat message. So essentially the mRNA is like a Snapchat message that gets into your body, um, is there just for 24 hours in this particular situation. And then um, in just long enough for your body to figure out how do I dismantle this when the real virus comes along and then it's gone. Wow. I, I love the Snapchat analogy. That's, uh, I think, for some of our younger viewers, that will be a uh, very uh, an easy way to imagine that. Um, so you, like I said, are taking part in a vaccine trial. It's the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. Um, who developed this vaccine? So very great question. Uh, so one of the two um, scientists that led the development of the, there are several different vaccines, but specifically the Moderna vaccine against the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID-19 um, was Kismikia Corbett. And Kismikia Corbett is a black female uh, doctor. Um, she's a PhD who was involved in Project Seed as a high schooler and got very interested in STEM at that time. And she got connected to a wonderful mentor who exposed her to uh, the, the wonderful things about STEM. And she's actually one of the two scientists that actually uh, developed the mRNA technology that is the basis of the vaccine in the Moderna uh, and also the Pfizer um, vaccines. Oh, I didn't know that. That's amazing. Uh, yeah, that's an amazing story. And she was a high schooler when she got interested in STEM. Yes. So that's those who are watching right now and listening, <laughs> see that it starts at high school or earlier. So Absolutely. take that with you. <laughs> yeah. um, so this trial that's happening, people are taking part in it locally. Do you, do you have an estimate of maybe how many people are in the trial here in the Cincinnati area? I think at last count, it was about 173. Okay. Okay, are they, um, is that a large number for a city of our size? Uh, so we, we have a total, we're one of 90 sites. We have a total of 30,000 people um, okay. across all 90 sites that are involved. So we have a good number. And I think the unique thing about our site is that Carl Fichtenbaum, who is a physician here, he's our primary investigator, the, the main person in charge of the um, vaccine program here at our university. Um, he did a really, really good job of trying to make sure that the people who are 
in our trial reflect the percentage of the population out there. So for example, um, he tried to make sure that we had as many Black and Latinx um, participants in the trial as we could to reflect the number of Black and Latinx people in our community. Oh, that's really neat. And um, that's, that's really important. I'll touch on that later. Um, why I'd like to learn more about that in particular, but that's that's really interesting to hear that it's very reflective of the population here in the city. Um, so this may be an obvious question, but can you tell us what the goal of the study is and how it's being conducted and um, ultimately what what will we hope the vaccine will do or what it, what is it doing? So the goal of the study really is to be an instrumental part in um, solving the situation, which is this pandemic that we have. And uh, I think that there are multiple different ways that we're going to have to address this. Um, obviously, we're already using masking. We're already using socially distancing. We've always needed to do hand washing. Um, those are three very important things that, that are already being done and have actually decreased the presentation of flu, for example, this season. Um, but we needed to have some additional pieces and the vaccine uh, is a critical piece of us getting from, from where we are to back to normal. Okay, yeah. And um, you have an analogy for these, these vaccine developments. And um, can you share, share that with us? Absolutely. I think as I've gone ahead, and I think I've done about 25 different presentations here or there um, on TV or radio and so forth. And the one thing that I think is important as I've done these is really to translate some of the complex science into really understandable nuggets so patients can actually take information and use it to make decisions. And so the one question that I've had a fair amount is, you know, these vaccines were made way too fast. In fact, the title Operation Warp Speed just is the wrong title. It just um, makes it seem like um, corners were cut and it was just done too hastily. And that really is not the case. In fact, coronaviruses, which is the family in which SARS-CoV-2 um, virus lives, have been studied um, for about 20 years or so at the National Institutes of Health. And so when we found out early in December um, of last year that SARS was an issue, um, really the only thing that we needed to do over the past 11 months or so was really to look at the outside of the virus and determine the genome or the um, recipe uh, to make one of the spike proteins, which is on the outside of the virus. And once we had figured out what that spike protein genome was, um, its makeup essentially, we were able to go ahead and develop that vaccine. And then it was essentially going through phase one, two, and three, which um, essentially looking at how safe it is and how effective it is. And so really the analogy that I use is the cake um, again, 20 years worth of research, the cake was already baked. All we had to do this past year was find the flavor of the icing and ice that cake. So it was 20 years and one instead of just one year of development. Right, and with any vaccine, they're not gonna develop it so quickly and then do studies on it carelessly. There's, there's a lot of care and a lot of science, lots of science behind it. So this Absolutely. is something that, and again, coronavirus is not new like you were saying. So this is something that is being delegated with a lot of care, but with a lot of science backing it. So, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, so some people say that the COVID vaccine might be like a flu shot, but it's not like a flu shot. Um, you've touched on it a lot already, but could you expand on that a little bit? A lot of people say COVID is like the flu. In, in a, oh. It's really not. Um, the flu actually is something, of course, that comes around every year, and the vaccine um, is completely different. We've never used mRNA technology before. Uh, in the past, viruses um, have been used as part of the vaccines, um, and that is, again, a completely different situation. There's no virus in um, the vaccines that are used for COVID right now. Um, the flu also is the vaccine is made based on last year's flu. So we're trying to predict what this year's flu is. That's a completely different thing than knowing ahead of time um, what the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein is, which we know very specifically into the, to the very last particle, so. Right, okay. 
Um, so you've touched on this in other interviews you've done, but you are taking part in this study in part because the Black community is underrepresented in these trials. Um, can you tell us why that is maybe? Yeah, so, you know, again, for the Moderna trial, you know, there was a concerted effort really to make sure we reflect um, the percentage. However, there is a significant um, pathway uh, to these discussions with Black and Latinx communities um, about having a vaccine. Um, that, that past is littered with uncomfortable truths around um, vaccine trials and experiments in general. Uh, one in particular would be the Tuskegee experiment in which uh, African-American men were, uh, who had syphilis were involved in the study. And when they found out that penicillin did work, um, they still kept the men in the study, withheld penicillin from them, and they developed um, horrific things um, as a result. So there was, this was an unethical um, practice. There were also, going back to slavery, um, all kinds of things were done on um, women who were slaves uh, as far as using their body. And then Henrietta Lacks, you know, her cells were used for cancer studies uh, without her permission. So there's a justified mm -hmm. um, hesitancy and suspicion around, you know, why do they want us to be first in line to get the vaccines this time? Why, you know, and so forth. And it's a very understandable thing. And when I speak to uh, patients who are Black or Latinx, you know, I have to come to that conversation First of all, acknowledging these difficult truths. Number two, with some compassion, with respect, and with patience. Um, typically, these interactions um, and conversations are not single conversations. Um, this was not something that developed over, um, you know, just one or two episodes. This is a long past littered um, mm -hmm. these uncomfortable truths that needs to be dismantled um, with trust in a physician-patient relationship. Yes. Thank you for, that's that's an uncomfortable topic to, to talk about, but it's important. So thank you for taking a few moments to, to tell us a little bit about that. And there's a very wonderful book about Henrietta Lacks called The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. Yes. And it's a difficult read at times, um, but it's it's a really great book. And we'll, we'll include a link to that book in the description of this event, along with some other resources. Excellent. But, yeah. Um, so... For someone who is watching this, they may have lots of questions. Do you have some resources to share where they could learn more about COVID, more about the COVID-19 vaccines, more about family medicine that mm -hmm. we can share with our viewers? Absolutely. Um, so knowledge about COVID is ever evolving. So um, one way to keep track is actually coronavirus dot ohio dot gov and that has a whole slew of new latest information number of people who have covid what it actually is what the sars cov2 um, virus is and so forth and um, there's also there are also two other things that um, studies that i've found very useful as well um, so that would be the kaiser family foundation um, they do have a study that's out um, also, the NAACP did a vaccine hesitancy study. It's called the Coronavirus uh, Hesitancy in Black and Latinx Communities. And then with regard to family medicine, um, the American Academy of Family Physicians is the national organization for family physicians here in the United States. They are phenomenal. They're my home. They're my professional support. Uh, they have a website. It's called double, um, it's aafp.org. So okay. aafp.org, and that has all kinds of information. You know, what is um, a family physician? Why would I go into medicine? How do I get into medical school? Um, you know, what are the different specialties out there? Uh, things like that. Sure, no, that's wonderful. And again, we'll share links to all those sites in the event description for anyone who wants to learn a little bit more. So Dr. Edgy, I did wanna ask you about representation in the STEM fields, and you are a woman of color in the medical field, and that's really important. Um, I don't think we always have doctors that look like us necessarily, so I did want to ask you um, how important is it to have more people of color be in the medical field? 
Oh, it's so important. And I get reminded every, every time I walk into the office, um, one of my interactions that I had um, meeting a patient last February was, uh, you know, I walked into the patient's room and she stifled a gasp with her hands and then just started crying. And she, she declared that she has never had a black doctor before. And uh, like within a minute of meeting each other, we hugged. And I think in large part, that was because there are certain shared experiences that we have as black women that we don't have to spend energy explaining to each other during our patient physician relationship. And so for us, that, that was a great relief. And um, that, you know, I've been here for a year now, just over a year. Um, that happened almost the first day I got um, to Cincinnati and meeting patients. And that also happened last week with a patient who walked in and she, you know, again, just was grateful. It was a weight off of her shoulders, not have to explain. Um, and we do know from studies as well that um, patients are more likely to take advice from physicians who look like them. So um, that, that is always something that helps me as a physician to do a better job for my patient. Awesome. Thank you for telling such a personal story with that, but yes, uh, representation does matter. And um, I hope for anyone watching this that they they know that they can go and find a doctor that looks like them. That's exactly right. And then my very last question for you, Dr. Edgy, is what advice would you give to young women and girls who may be interested in having a career in a STEM field? So one thing I definitely will say is do not let your own mind disqualify you. Um, you know, what we always want to do is to make sure that you don't self-reject. Right. And so uh, you want to connect yourself to a mentor, somebody mm -hmm. who is able to go ahead and expose you to opportunities, to see your talent, to nurture you, and to remove barriers that could be in your way toward getting to what you envision is your best self. Yes, awesome. Thank you. Mentors are really important. Um, so I think as early as we can encourage someone who may have these interests to find someone who has this career. It's very complimentary a lot of times if someone, a high school student, middle school student calls or emails and says, I wanna learn about your career. I wanna learn about your job. Um, nine times out of 10, someone is going to want to talk to you about, about that. So for those listening, it could be very intimidating, but you know, work on an email with your grownups in your house, work on a phone call and, and call that person you know, email them. You may have someone in your family or a family friend that's in that field. So, you know, definitely, definitely take some time to find that out. And with COVID happening, you know, that's where a phone call, a Zoom call like this might be a really great way to connect with someone. So that's, that's wonderful advice. So thank you. Absolutely. And I'm happy to also, um, I've got many mentees as well at different stages in their career. Um, I have a daughter who's 22 as well. Um, so I do work with youth too. So um, I'm certainly accessible and certainly will be glad to connect people with other people as well. So oh. we are not scary at all. In fact, we, we are just really excited um, to have people who are interested in STEM. That's wonderful. Thank you. And thank you for joining us, Dr. Edgy. And thank you all for watching and we'll see you next time. Thank you for having me.